Here's what's next on the Nice Guys on Business. Ideal clients for me are leaders, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs who are struggling to get the company to the next level or the idea to the next level. Uh, my my skill sets, Doug, you know, I have the abilities to come in and see through things very quickly. Um, it really is a skill of mine. And just get ri- get see through the bullshit. You know, most, of, you know, th- three quarters of life is bullshit, period. And so the ability to see through the bullshit and get to what matters, you know, because you're dealing with people. So what do I do? I move people. I motivate people. I inspire people. I draw people to projects and to ideas because, you, you know, I say all the time, unless dogs and cats can speak English, I can't use them to build a company. Oh, Toto, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. Well, except maybe the Nice Guys on Business podcast. They always fuck you at the drive-thru. Oh, and on the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Need an education on how to grow your business? The nice guys are here to help. Learn about great customer service, networking, and how just being nice can help you prosper. Now, here are your hosts, Doug Sandler and Strickland Bonner. Welcome back. Welcome back, Funkin' fans. Today we're talking to Greg Centineo, and I have to say it right away because the pronunciation is so weird. (laughs) Doug just said it. If I don't say it immediately, I'm going to screw it up. You know, you know, I was telling you about this. Greg actually has some deep rooted connections to Brooklyn. And, you know, everybody that's gotten in Brooklyn has some connections to some wise guys. So, Strickland, I don't think you should ever say Centineo and weird in the same sentence or he might he might have some buddies that that are come visit you. That is good advice. I'm going to keep that in mind. Just, Thank you, just Greg. So you and of know. course, when I said weird, I meant weird as in I don't know how to say it. Not weird <laughs> like you are anything. It's on me. Totally on me. No, I totally, totally get it. And he he has the ability to raise a lot of money. I can tell you that. And he probably has some pretty influential friends. So, Strick, just just back it off. Just back. Well, those it are off both great things, and that's what we're going to talk about on the uh, on the interview today, right? Did you do you ever get the feeling that that everybody that has a Brooklyn accent is somehow connected to Tony Soprano? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the uh, the stereotype, which is not really a good one. But you know, I don't know if it could be accurate. Maybe not. Don't know. I I am uh, I'm watching right now on um on Netflix. I'm watching this show called uh oh crap, what is the name of it again? Um uh, oh Narcos, Narcos. Yeah, you were telling me about that, but it's a it's, Western. No, <laughs> no, that was the last them, one. The last one was a Western. Mixed, yeah, you're getting them all mixed up. The this this is not a Western. The uh, the Western was um uh Hell's oh uh, Hell on Rails or something. Yeah, right? Hell yeah, Hell, hell on Wheels. Hell, hell on Wheels, exactly. Which totally doesn't sound like a Western about the railroads, but okay. Yeah, yeah that that one was good, but I I finished that. That was like five or six seasons, so I I yeah. listened to my fifty some odd episodes or ninety episodes of that. And then I'm just try- I was like going through a whole bunch of other ones, you know. I saw Flash, and I saw you know there's a bunch of Marvel ones, and then and then I landed on Narcos. And what's so cool about Narcos? It's it's kind of like the um, I'm a Quentin Tarantino fan, and they do a lot of exposition in Quentin Tarantino. You know, they break. They, they, yeah, you talked about this last week. Oh, well, you said on, exactly Strick. the same thing. <laughs> well, if you want to say something different about the show, great, but don't say how it was. It's Quentin Tarantino influenced, and they obviously like Quentin Tarantino, and there's a lot of exposition. So I wouldn't like it because I don't like so much exposition. You said exactly that last week. God, you're so you're so angry. You're just, just bring up angry. something different. Hey, there must be something else great about the show you can talk about if it's that good. It's it's a lot about the whole drug scene in the in the uh, 70s and 80s. Okay, there you go. That's cool. We can go into that. That's fine then. You did not mention that last week. I'm fine with that. All right. Well, I didn't want to. I didn't want to break. You know, I didn't want to give away too much in case somebody is new to list. Isn't? I think the show is. It was like created like six years ago. I think you need enough to give away to get them interested because I still had no idea what it was about when you were talking about it last week. It's about the Colombian drug cartel. There How about go. that? Okay. Is that good? That and it and it takes place in in Colombia. <laughs> Columbia. Columbia. Columbia, right. Columbia, right, exactly. South America. Not Columbia, Maryland, right down the road from me. No, no. Although there is some drug issues going on in your town. You realize that, right? There's drug issues going on in every town. All right, isn't just there? making sure. You're not cooking in your house, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing any Walter White shit, no. no. I'm not making meth that's, here. At my wait, house. that's a whole different. That's a whole different. Uh... I am just not. In, you ever watch Breaking Bad? Oh yeah, I watched the the whole. I haven't seen it in years, but I. I just but, don't like it. I can't you really? get into it. 
everybody loves it and says how amazing it is. And I've tried watching like four or five of the opening episodes, and I'm like, eh. Just hey Strickland, I'm sorry you you did mention that before. We you probably don't want to talk about it again, you know. I know. <laughs> Dude, I mentioned that like a year and a half ago. I didn't talk about it last week and make exactly the same points about it last week that I made, okay? Can we just all talk right. about Overcast, please? We need some help on Overcast. All right, all right. Well, why don't you do the Overcast promo today since I did it on Monday, okay? That is the one thing that we can talk about over and over again ad nauseum, and I will not tell you not to talk about it. No, it's a good, we, it's a good thing. Go ahead. We need your help on Overcast. We know that you guys are listening on Overcast. Please recommend, recommend, recommend. Each individual episode, you can get a little gold star. And Sean, doing that last week, has uh, gotten us back into the top 10 on Most Recommended, which is where we need to be. We really really love to be number one but we know we got some heavy hitters out there that have way more downloads than us but we at least want to stay up there and it's because of you guys we love you thank you please recommend thank you. every episode thank you and and i know we did chat about this just a little bit yesterday on tuesday's episode but uh but paul did such a great job of helping uh people on itunes actually leave reviews he's actually sharing like the he's got a goal he's he said you know we have 159 reviews right now on yeah. uh, on itunes so we're trying to go for for 200 and probably by the time this airs we'll have a few more um a few more reviews as well but uh-huh. what a great job of promoting Paul, the the co mayor, Paul and Tim doing a, a, a yeoman's job on uh, on Facebook community. But but uh, I've noticed a number of posts that Paul has made really promoting the the um, the, re- the ratings, the reviews, the subscribes on iTunes. Uh, you know, we do have the philosophy that basically fuck iTunes. I know we know that, <laughs> but at the same time, it's really nice to see somebody helping us. No, I don't we care where the help is, I don't care where the help is coming from. <laughs> Always appreciate it. So, uh, Greg Centineo, he is our interview today. What was so great about Greg is that he was the executive producer on a movie called Legends of Oz, Dorothy's Return. Now, you may or may not be familiar with that movie, but I know for sure that even if you're not familiar with the movie, you've heard of names like Dan Aykroyd, Jim Belushi, and Martin Short. So I talked to him a little bit about the the uh, the partying styles of Dan, Jim, and Martin. Can you imagine being like partying with uh, with Jim Belushi? Remember, you, you remember John Belushi, right? From the early uh, when mm-hmm. did he when did he uh, OD? You remember? Oh gosh, eighty, nineteen eighty, eighty one, something it like was, that. It was something like the eighties. So his brother Jim, I thought was just like a like a wannabe, but the guys end up the guy ends up being like a, an amazing comic himself. Oh yeah, he's been very funny. He's been on a lot of TV shows, and he's been in movies. and And this this is uh, the Re- Legends of Oz is actually an animated film. So these are right. all like voice acting that he's worked with them. Right, yeah. right. So uh, I get into it a little bit about what it's like to uh, party with Dan, Jim, and uh, and Martin. And he says Martin Short is actually uh, he's not. He, I mean, he might seem like he's a nerd, but he's actually a really cool guy. <laughs> Okay, that's cool. So uh, anyway, so I talked to him about the executive being an executive producer of a movie. I talked to him about uh, creating and building big teams and great teams, and how to scale your business and how to raise funds for your for your business. It's not just all about the movie. It is about how to uh, how to run and manage your own business too, because he uh, he does come full circle and make it relatable to uh, to you, nice guy community, so that you understand how it might fit into your your everyday workspace. So um, any words before we get to him? No, man, let's just keep it brief and let's get right to the interview. Let's dive in. Greg Centineo right here on the Nice Guys on Business Podcast. Imagine being able to to frame everything you do concisely, precisely, and creatively into a, an, into a compelling story that people would want to hear about. Create energy enough to get people to take action and seek you out, uh, even if your industry is filled with competition, which I know a lot of our Nice Guy community is filled with competition. Today's guest, Greg Centineo, he's here to share. He's a money raiser, he's a leadership expert, and he's an all-around nice guy. Welcome, Greg, to the Nice Guys on Business podcast. Thanks, Doug. Great to be with you. Hey, I when I started reading some of your your background, I got a little nervous. I got I have to be honest with you. I mean, I was starting to see things like um, executive producer of uh, Legends of Oz: Dorothy's Return. I mean, that was a movie that actually did well in the box office. That's a that's a pretty good resume booster. It was that an exciting project to work on? Man, that was that was the project of a lifetime for me. We that, that how did was that even come together? How did something like that happen? It was uh, it was really it was an improbability. Um, you know, I got a, I had no experience in the animation field or in, you know, raising funds of any, of any nature. And just a small independent production company in Los Angeles had a great idea to, to do a sequel to The Wizard of Oz. 
based off of um, the great grandson's books, Roger Baum, uh, the you know, the um, sequels to The Wizard of Oz, and they came to me and and said, "Look, we need your help." And um, and I looked at the the project. I thought this is a this is a great opportunity, man. Yeah, really great opportunity to kind of play in that in that space of of animation, you know. And so we did it without any studio participation. We did it completely outside of the studio system. Um, raised a hundred and twenty two million dollars during the recession for that. Oh my gosh! So so I'm assuming one of the strains that we're going to talk about today is a little bit about how to raise money, how to scale a business, how to do it. There is no such time. When somebody says to me, well, the times are bad. I'm like, yeah, fuck that. The times are always <laughs> bad, man. The times are always bad. You got to figure out a way how to build a business even in bad times. So it, that that probably was the thing that attracted me most to what you're all about is it seems like even in a crappy environment, you seem to uh, rise above it all. So how, how do you have the how do you have the balls to be able to even do that? Yeah, I think, you know, you're born with it. I, I really think, Doug, because it's Well, like, I can tell from that, that North Carolina accent we were chatting about <laughs> <laughs> before. That's, I think you get it from, from your, uh, from your, from your, your southern, your southern, uh, hospitality mentality. Is that right? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah I, I'm sure the Northeast had something to do with it. I mean, it's like, you know, you don't ever want to be, t I think, you no, know, growing up, I think I was, I was always a visionary and I use that term loosely as far as just, just an idea guy. You know, I always liked ideas and, and I was always told no, <laughs> you know, friends, you know, parents, you know, right, relatives right. always tell you it can't be done. I hated it, Doug. And so I kind of got this chip at my shoulder that basically said, if you tell me it can't be done, I'm going to do it. And um, and so that's kind of I think that was kind of what kind of thrusted me. And, um, you know, people catch me at the right time with an idea. And it's if it's improbable, I kind of like to grab it. That's, I, I think that that is the, the true sign and the true mark of an entrepreneur is somebody that will, if it, even if you're working at a hundred miles an hour on a different project, if you hear something, don't you always find the bandwidth to be able to figure out how to get it into your, into your play? You do. It's, you do. I, I do. I mean, I feel like it's, it's a mindset, you know, and, um, I, I, I firmly believe, Doug, this is something that I, 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 it's deep into my soul. I believe we can do anything in the in this world that we choose to do if we put our minds to it we can accomplish it and it's not just words because obviously you've read about it, what i've done and so a matter of fact everybody told me in those days with the legends project that our friends family everybody around me said this is absurd you guys won't raise any money it's you know it was the recession bernie madoff had just you know come out in yep. 08 we had every challenge you know imaginable that was facing us and you know, and I'm not stupid, Doug. I mean, I looked at it and I said, this is an improbability. Uh, matter did of fact, they come, did they come to you with the, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you no. there, but I, I'm just curious. Did they come to you with the idea of, hey, listen, we need an executive producer on this? Or did you figure out how to put yourself in the position to be the executive producer and, and discover how to raise all of these funds? Because they probably can't, I'm thinking they came to you and said, we need money to put this together. And you couldn't have just said, well, I got, I know how I can get 122 million. <laughs> I mean, how did that happen? I don't even know how that happens. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, it, it wasn't even, it wasn't even on the radar, 122 million, actually. They came to me, uh, through a mutual friend, somebody knew of me, and I was kind of always, whatever I did was working. You know, I kind of, I'm a divergent in, in st my style of leadership is very divergent, you know, and so it works, you know, when I was in the church, it worked when I was, you know, in lending, it worked, you know, it didn't mm -hmm. cough in the coffee business. It worked. I just, you know, I would do things divergently and make them happen. So they came to me and just said, Hey, this is a great idea. We've raised about $2 million. We need 20 million to get this done. And, um, what do you think? And I actually said no for almost seven <laughs> months to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Of course, it's got. It's called the. You know, it's like the Legends of Oz. I mean, Dorothy's Return. It's the Wizard of Oz. It's got. There's no. There. There is no franchise that's connected to that. That was successful in the past, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right. Why the. Why the. Anybody comes to me and says, "I have an idea. I want to do something with the Wizard of Oz." I don't give a shit. You want me to be the Tin Man? I'm going to be the guy putting on the cowardly <laughs> lion outfit if you need me to be. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and you know that was the that was the the carrot for me was two carrots. One, it was the based you know connected to the Wizard of Oz, which top ten movie of all time in history. Right, you know, right. can't kill it. You know, even if you don't like it, you watch it. Right. So right. that was one carrot. The second carrot was it was a golden opportunity because of the recession to do something alternative. 
um, you know, every investment at the time, traditional conventional investment was on fire. Mm -hmm. So we needed something different, right? We needed to kind of chart and pioneer a different course. And so the fact that it was in the animation industry, which is highly lucrative because of all of the ancillaries associated with children's, you know, animation films, I thought this is, you know, this is how I coined it, Doug. It's an opportunity of a lifetime for me. And, and though everything was, you know, I used to actually tell the investors, it's an opportunity of a lifetime in which you will lose all your money. It was, it was <laughs> oh, you just didn't complete the sentence. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did. <laughs> I did. What's, I would. So gr- what's so great about it is that it's like a, um, you know, at the time that you did it, what did, you, did it come out? You say 2013? Is that when it came out? It came out May 9th of, of 2014. Of 14. I mean, it, that was like at the, a, a little bit, into the curve of when companies like Sony and DreamWorks and Pixar and all those companies were like fucking making millions, billions of dollars. And it was just, just at the perfect, it, you don't know this when you do it only, you only know this in hindsight, but at the time, gosh, what a, what a, what a lucrative environment to get in. Well, that was, that industry was just exploding. It, it always, it always is exploding. It seems to never have a downturn. Um, when you kind of do some studies on animation, it's just amazing. It's like a community. It's like a little community that's been around for, you know, 60, 70 years that's been doing absolutely amazing. So when you're not producing movies, <laughs> Greg, because because although it is a very interesting story, I'm trying to think of some level of relatability to our nice guy community that's out there and those guys are listening. So that's nice. So how can I fucking make money, Doug? I mean, <laughs> help, help me with this. So, right. so when you're not producing movies, what is it that you do that you thought when you when you saw an opportunity to come on this show and, and talk to, let's see, I got my mom and my cousin listening today. So we got at least two <laughs> other listeners today. So what was it that you thought would be attractive to an audience of entrepreneurs to, to hear what part of your message well it's because i am an entrepreneur you know i'm not a movie producer i i i became a movie producer for for a project you know um and so the the lessons you know that i've learned both positive and negative are very valuable to entrepreneurs you know it's the ability you know what is an entrepreneur it's somebody that that that's approached with an idea and then has to figure out how to get it how to create it and make turn it into reality so you know and and you typically you're going to have Everybody telling you it's not going to be done or it can't be done. And so you have to have something inside you to do it. I mean, if you, you know, all of my things were entrepreneurial, you know, everything I've stepped into, I've been in about 10 different industries. And I always say it started at the bottom and walked out on top. Um, and the idea is that you don't let anything get in your way. You know, yep. you, if you have a dream, I always tell my kids, you know, listen, nobody gives a fuck about your dreams, but you, <laughs> <laughs> but you, right. Exactly. Right. I, I don't even care about your dreams and you're my kids. <laughs> so, right. Yeah, and so the reality, my point to them is you're going to have to will those dreams into existence because nobody else will, you know? And so, you know, I always say how many other entrepreneurs had the chance to grab the legends project in 07, 08 when I was looking at it. And everyone said, no way. No, everyone walked away. And then, of course, when we got traction, you know, I was a genius. Right. You know, right. what did you see? So it's valuable to every entrepreneur out there is, you know, my, I stepped into things that didn't exist. I walked out and we willed them into existence. So, and, and by the way, you know, with failures along the way, um, you know, I would say the one, th- I, it's interesting, Doug, I am batting a thousand. Every, every idea that's come to me, came to me, we put into motion and we actually created and got it out to market. Not all of them made money. And at this point, legend still hasn't made money because it was a fail. It was, it didn't do well in box office. It didn't do as no? well as it, No, it, it was, it actually, the story goes, Doug, we did everything we could. You know, we, a, a list cast, you know, Sony backed the film musically. Uh, Fox backed it DVD wise. We had, we raised $32 million to distribute the film and market the movie. It's, that, that's unprecedented in Hollywood history, by the way, for an independent. We were a wide release, 4,000 screens domestically, unheard of for independent filmmaking. Um, but at the end, we had to hand the project, our baby, you know, to a third party distributor who absolutely botched it up. Oh, took thirty two million dollars and completely botched it up. So my project now is I'm you know, I'm in I'm <laughs> fix it. <laughs> fix it. I'm back in it and you know, gonna try to turn it around and and so but but again, you know, so you can do everything as an entrepreneur, right, guys, that you're you that you promise. You can actually over deliver the things that you promise, right? But when you turn it over to somebody else, will they treat it and handle it, you know, and care about it the way you did? 
So that's a valuable lesson. I loved looking at some of the, maybe some of the background information, some of the uh, players that were in the, the movie. Dan Aykroyd was in it. Jim Belushi was in it. Martin Short was in it. <laughs> um, I mean, that had to be like a freaking comedy fest to be able to do that. I mean, as an executive producer, did you get to hang out and party with those guys at all? I, I did. I did, which was really a lot of fun. Those guys are so talented. Um, yeah, I mean, just 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 the way they think and they ad lib, it just was, it was a, you know, opportunity that was absolutely unprecedented for me. Kelsey Grammer was my favorite. I was going to say, there's got to be a favorite in there. And we're just boys talking here, but it wasn't Martin Short. He was like the nerd of the bunch, right? I mean, tell me he was, because he totally looks like the nerd. But I, I can see him being a guy that's probably like a partier behind the scenes. But uh, it, the way he plays it, just like, an, I mean, I relate to him the most because I'm a t- total geek. The most. <laughs> yeah. No, M- Martin's amazing. I mean, he's brilliant, uh, funny. Wild. I mean, out of his mind. I mean, in a nice way, but he's completely out of his mind. No, he's furthest thing from a nerd that you'll ever, you'll ever depict. <laughs> he might, he might, look, he might look like one, but yeah, he might, he might <laughs> definitely. You know, you, you remind me of a little bit of a, of a mellow, uh, Gary V between your accent and your attitude of just, hey, listen, dude, it just balls to the wall. You just got to make it, you got to make shit happen. And nobody gives a fuck about your dreams except for you. And so you got to make them happen. Have you ever had a chance to, uh, to work on any projects with Gary? I haven't, but you know, you're, you're, the, you're not the first person to say that to me. They call me a mellow version of Gary V. <laughs> you, you totally know? got, you are, you yeah. really are. Yeah. No, so, thank you. So help me with, um, with some of your strengths because, uh, again, I want to put it in, uh, some level. Of, I keep bringing you back to the movie thing because fuck, it's just such an interesting topic to talk about. But, but you do have this vast amount of experience in doing things like building teams, understand how to, uh, to scale a business, just getting operations down and, and tweaking things to the nth degree. So share with me a little bit about what you do when you're not producing movies. Uh, you know, what, what else? You're a business consultant, so you, you work with businesses. What else? What do you do? Like, what's an ideal client for you to walk in and see uh, this is a problem that you need to, to solve? Ide- ideal clients for me are leaders, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, CEOs who de- are struggling to get the company to the next level or the idea to the next level. Uh, my, my skill sets, Doug, you know, I have the abilities to come in and see through things very quickly. Um, it really is a skill of mine and just get rid, get, see through the bullshit. You know, most of, you know, th- three quarters of life is bullshit, period. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so the ability to see through the bullshit and get to what matters, you know, cause you're dealing with people. So what do I do? I move people. I motivate people. I inspire people. I draw people to projects and to ideas because you, you know, I say all the time, unless dogs and cats can speak English, I can't use them to build a company. It's just, I, you know, so I'm left keep with- Keep them out of the office. <laughs> keep them out. I'm, I'm left with humans, you know, at this point. So. Yeah, but, but how old are your, how old are your kids? 22 are your kids? and 21. Okay. Same. So mine are 21 and 24. So same age. So you're probably in your late forties, early fifties, somewhere in there. Yeah. And it's like, this is the environment that we grew up in. It's like, fuck, get the foosball table the fuck out of here. I don't want a beer tap in my office because that just means be a DWI and people getting, getting arrested on my nickel. So I don't want to hear that shit, but let's face the facts. This is, this is what this next generation who is constant, who's growing up with their cell phone in their fucking hands all the time and saying, you know, we need it and we need it now. We'll work 24 seven, but we need to, you know, have a, have a nap room <laughs> at, our, at the office. So how do you deal with companies that are like, and I, I don't mean to sound so negative about it, but how do we deal with companies that do have that approach that we need to move over to this environment? Because it sounds like, you know, you're like, get rid of the dogs and cats and screw the Screw the ping pong table. No, I'm not actually. I'm I'm really pro millennial. I'm no, <laughs> oh, very pro ping pong table. Yeah. Pro, well, okay. I really am because you know the this 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 kind of this age group, if you would, is you know coined now the millennials. They they're awake more than anything. They're very aware of what's going on. They talk about seeing through bullshit, Doug. I mean, they right. see through it. They're born. You know, almost like indigos. They, they see through this stuff. So we have mm-hmm. a lot to learn from the millennials. And the problem is, you know, you, you have two different completely, you know, f- thought patterns between the older generation and this new generation. And they are kind of, kind of paradoxical to each other. But, um, I hang with millennials. You know, you can see some of my startups that I, I work with yep. millennials on. These, these kids are amazing. They're, they're at it. They're smart. They get it done. Um, you know, they take my advice, they apply it, it works. Um, and I love working with them and I, I have a lot to learn from them and I sit with them and, you know, it's a mutual relationship and I would encourage 
anyone out there that's that's running a business, you have to you have to engage this younger generation. Um, one because first of all, they are completely adept when it comes to social media. And oh my gosh, so much though. You're right about that. I mean, Doug, and it's not. Go- I always tell the elderly, it's not going anywhere. Get a right. computer. It's, right. <laughs> it's not like it's going to stop tomorrow, right. you know. This internet fad, you know, this is going to go. This is going to go away. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. agree. Gaming is going to disappear. No, it's this is it, guys. You know, and you know, di- digital digital likeness, right? Intellectual properties. You know, these it's no longer real estate. It's intellectual properties. It's digital, and business money is going to be earned today for the rest of the world's existence through digital intellectual properties. And so this, this group is a tremendous resource to us because they're, they're proficient at it, man. They're three years old. They're playing with iPhones and that's awesome. So you can tell where my heartbeat is, you know, and I tell aging companies, you know, that don't want to change. I say, well, listen, I'm not saying you're going to die. You just, you're just not going to go anywhere and you're going to come obsolete. That's just the reality. So it is a passion of mine, and you can see I shifted, you know, about six, seven years ago. Most of the people I work with today are in their 20s. Well, you, ha- you have to shift. Uh, when I, uh, and I, and I was telling you this a little bit before we hit the record button, you know, I've spent the last 30 years as a, as a bar mitzvah MC, and I'm in a business at, in my, and I, and I, and I don't necessarily, I know it's going to be beeped out because Strickland, my co-host and editor of this will never let me for some reason sh- share my age on, but I'm 53 years old just about, and I'm in a business dominated by 20 something. So s- five or six years ago, I went through this whole reinvention to become a professional speaker and do the podcasting thing. And as soon as I hit podcasting and wrote a book, it all became about how do I expose my message through digital, through social media, and I never realized how much strength. I mean, I could do 90% of what I do in my pajamas every day sitting in front of my computer. And it's just, it blows my mind to think I actually make a living not going anywhere. You know, it's like yeah. nobody goes anywhere anymore. Yeah. No, I heard you actually, I listened to one of your shows. You said the same thing. I thought it was brilliant, you know, working in your pajamas. Um, and the, I, if I could do it all, all day, every day, the 10% is, is just because I, I got to go to the grocery store every once in a while. <laughs> I'll give you a little tip. I will, I just wear Lululemon. I wear my, my workout clothes all day and I can go out if I have to, you know, but it's the same thing. And the point is right because there's a new way of making money that monetization today is completely different than it was 10 years ago. And, uh, I, you know, and it's like we said earlier, this is, you have to get on board with this. Um, you know, I speak at, you know, colleges, University of Miami, and it's important for me to speak there because I, I really get to develop relationships with, with, with this generation. Well, if nothing else comes out of today's interview, I, I realized that Lululemon has a men's section now. I did not, I didn't know that. Is that, is that true? When did they have that? Has that always been? No, it's not. Always- for years. No, at least, I know at least, at least I got it. I've been buying Lululemon, I think, since 12, 2012. Yeah. Did not I did not know that. Do you shop in any other women's clothing stores? <laughs> I, I only hear, you know, I, I, I live in Montgomery County in Maryland. It's just uh, the Pot- Potomac, Maryland, which is like the, you know, the, the hotbed of, of every, you know, rich Jewish woman lives in my neighborhood, except I'm the I'm the poor Jewish guy. I'm the one that brings the, the median value down a little bit. But these are my people. And I and I'm like, I've never seen a guy shop at Lululemon before. I'm, I'm glad to know that I can walk in there with confidence now. You can, man. No, you can't. It's funny. My my son says the same thing. It came out. It actually came out. The truth came out with him a few months ago, and he said, "Dad, uh-uh. Dad I'm, not, I'm not buying that stuff." I said, "What stuff?" He said, "The Lululemon stuff." I'm thinking, is something wrong with it? I don't. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I didn't realize it. So, respond to this comment. Let me, let me understand where your, where your, uh, where your mindset is. Um, I know that building strengths is a team of yours. So, which, which comment do you relate to better? You find good people. That would be number one. Or number two, good people find you. I, I find good people be good people you know it's the the biggest challenge is just finding those it's it's knowing where to look i think that oftentimes i mean what we have found as a part of running this show over the last several years is that is that our community has reached out to us we have several people within our community that have have really come to our rescue to support us i mean they want to help us they want to help us grow the audience they want to help us build our our network they want to help us with with um you know practical operations day to day I I have a really tough time finding good people. They seem to find us a lot. So I don't know which way the, is the better approach to take. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it happens both ways. I mean, I'm always, I'm just aware. I'm looking at, I mean, I sit with an Uber driver. I can sit with a drive, you know, a five minute drive with Uber and I, and I look at the, the woman or the guy and I go, this, this person's got some talent, man, you know, right. and I, and I'll talk to him and then kind of grab phone numbers. And I have a good, I have a good sense of that, you know, and I think most leaders have to start trusting that. I mean, I find them everywhere, you know, so you don't, I don't look at resumes. I'm not interested in resumes. I can right. pick good people out. Hey man, Greg, you are a you are a wealth of information and knowledge. I, I definitely want to have you back on the uh, at the show at some point and uh, and understand and discover some some other projects and stuff that you're working on. If somebody wanted to get in touch with you to find out a little bit more about you know what you do and how you do it, how can they reach out to you? Uh, best way is my website, and it's uh, Greg at Greg Centineo C E N T I N E O dot com. Yeah, we'll make sure we put uh, access to, to Greg's website and everything out on the uh, website on uh, on the show notes. So, uh, one quick question before we uh, wrap up: um, Do you have your phone anywhere near you? I do. Great, great. Do you have an iPhone or something inferior? Uh, yeah, iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> Could you just do me a favor? Could you just say iPhone fucking a? <laughs> iPhone fucking a. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, we just just want to make sure that that our co-host, my co-host, who is a Google believer, he's uh, he, he all he doesn't think that that people that are actually intelligent have any any Apple products. But I'm 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 here to tell him that Greg Centineo, he is intelligent. He's a movie producer, and 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 he's got an iPhone. So thank you. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, man. Hey, I appreciate you you hanging with us. And um, yeah, we got all of his contact information in the show notes. We are uh, we are ready to go. A nice guy community. Never underestimate the value of nice. Again, special thanks to Greg Centineo for being on the show today. Greg, man, wealth of information. Thanks for being here. No, nah, Doug, thanks to you and the community. Thank you. Steve O'Brien, take us out of here. For the nice guys on business and in accordance with my court-mandated community service, I'm Steve O'Brien. Only 27 more voiceovers to go, and then maybe, maybe they'll let me leave the state and take this ankle bracelet off.